When diving into the icy depths of the Pacific Ocean, 13,000 feet down, something strange happens. The oxygen levels suddenly spike. It doesn't make sense since we're surrounded by this terrifying darkness. That's when researchers figured out they were dealing with something totally new – dark oxygen. This special kind of oxygen, formed in the cold depths of the ocean, could change our understanding of the origins of life on Earth. It might even bring us closer to finding life on distant planets. And it was all discovered by accident. Our adventure begins in the clarion clipperton zone, a vast area in Pacific waters that is larger than Mexico. When we dive to the very bottom here, we stumble upon these peculiar potato-shaped mounds scattered across the ocean floor. These are officially called polymetallic modules. They might not look like much, but these little mounds are like hidden treasure chests. Over millions of years, metals dissolved in seawater slowly collect around tiny bits of shell or debris, forming these nodules. Inside them, you'll find valuable metals like manganese, nickel, copper, and cobalt. These elements are crucial for making batteries, like the ones that power your cell phone and electric vehicles. That's why the clarion clipperton zone has become a hotspot for deep-sea mining. Today, 16 deep-sea mining contractors have permission to explore around 20% of its seafloor. This rush to the depths has made researchers curious to find out what's down there. So they've used some advanced machines to collect sediment from the sea bottom. And then things got strange. The instruments started showing something impossible massive amounts of oxygen produced on the seafloor, in complete total darkness. Now wait, that is not supposed to happen. You see, the deeper you go into the ocean, the less oxygen you find in the water. By the time you're about 3,000 feet down, there is barely any left. The water is too far from the surface for any atmospheric exchange. And to make matters worse, Oxygen is constantly being used up by the deep-sea organisms that live there and by bacteria breaking down organic matter. So oxygen production this far down is supposed to be impossible. At first, researchers didn't believe their eyes. They thought the sensors were broken or faulty, because every study ever done in the deep sea has only shown oxygen being consumed, not produced. But they kept seeing the same results repeatedly. For 10 years, this mysterious oxygen kept showing up. Finally, they realized the numbers might not be wrong. Turns out those metal nodules could be producing oxygen, working like batteries. When you drop a battery into seawater, you would see bubbles and hear fizzing because the electric current splits seawater into oxygen and hydrogen in a process known as electrolysis. So, the researchers' theory was that these nodules were doing the same thing, but in their natural state. And they were right. The nodules were, in fact, electrically charged, carrying about 0.95 volts. That's not enough to split seawater into hydrogen and oxygen. We would need about 1.5 volts for that, the power of a AA battery. But when these nodules cluster together, much higher voltages can be observed, enough to trigger the reaction and produce oxygen. So, in a way, these nodules were generating electric currents strong enough to split molecules of seawater and produce oxygen, even in the complete absence of light. This discovery is fascinating because it completely flips our understanding of how oxygen can be produced. Up until now, we have always thought oxygen was produced by photosynthesis. You know, that process where plants and algae convert sunlight into energy and release oxygen. But in this pitch-black deep-sea environment, oxygen was being produced purely through electrolysis. No sunlight was needed. That's why people started calling it dark oxygen. This finding makes us rethink how life might have started on Earth more than 3 billion years ago. Think about it. Plants need oxygen to survive, but they're the ones that produce oxygen. So where did the first oxygen come from? This complex issue sounds a bit like a chicken and egg situation, but it might have an answer now that we know oxygen can be made in ways that don't need sunlight or photosynthesis. 
It's possible there was another mysterious source of oxygen back then, which could have allowed oxygen-breathing life forms to exist even before photosynthesis became a thing. The dark oxygen doesn't just change our understanding of Earth's past. It also opens up new possibilities for life elsewhere in the universe. If this process is happening here on Earth, it might also be happening on other planets or moons. Take Saturn's moon Enceladus or Jupiter's moon Europa, for example. Both appear to have salty, liquid oceans hidden beneath thick layers of ice. Could dark oxygen be creating oxygen-rich environments in these oceans too? The implications go beyond our solar system. This discovery makes us rethink how we define potential habitats for life. As we explore exoplanets orbiting distant stars, understanding dark oxygen production could help us identify places where life might exist under conditions completely different from those on Earth. Instead of only looking for planets with sunlight, scientists might need to search for signs of chemical reactions that could support life even in complete darkness. This is all exciting news, but let's not forget how our story started with deep sea mining. This is how this process usually works. Companies send down a remote-controlled underwater vehicle, like a tractor, to crawl along the ocean floor. This vehicle picks up the metallic nodules and sediment and pulls them through a pipe up to a ship on the surface. Once they have the nodules, the crew sends the leftover sediment back into the ocean at mid-depth. The sediment eventually settles back down to the ocean floor. So is deep-sea mining good or bad? It's hard to say. On one hand, we found a massive and exciting deposits of metals that are essential for creating new, clean technologies like solar panels and electric vehicles. With the demand for these critical materials skyrocketing, and it could grow by up to 600% in the coming decades, deep-sea mining could be a game-changer. Some studies even argue that this activity might be less harmful than traditional mining. Since it happens far out at sea, it might help us avoid destroying forests or polluting water supplies. Plus, because it's so hard to reach these minerals, it might be easier to monitor this activity, keeping things under control and regulating the process. On the other hand, there is this current fear that looking for valuable minerals in the ocean could disrupt the dark oxygen process. Those metal-rich nodules aren't just sitting there doing nothing. I mean, they're actively participating in the chemical processes that shape our planet. So they could be playing a key role in everything, from nutrient cycles to the formation of new life. Scientists believe that mining could eventually damage marine life and seabed habitats that depend on dark oxygen. Despite its remote location and extreme conditions, the clarion clipperton zone is home to a surprisingly diverse and mysterious range of deep-sea creatures, from ghostly white sea anemones and deep purple sea cucumbers to tiny marine isopods, the distant cousins of the pill bug. But we know little about what's down there. It's believed that 90% of the creatures that live in the deep waters of the clarion clipperton zone are unknown to science. I mean, we do know about their existence, but they don't have an official name and the species can't be identified. Since the eerie creatures that live in pitch-black depths are still pretty much a mystery, it's hard to say if they or their environment would be really at risk if deep-sea mining continues at full speed. What experts do know is that we need more studies, more data, and more understanding. Scientists discover the largest water reservoir in the Oregon Cascades. It's hiding underground, holding more than twice the water volume of Lake Mead. Let me specify. It contains at least 19.4 cubic miles of water, which is almost 162 trillion bottles of water. If you drank one bottle a day, it would take you around 444 billion years to finish your stock. No wonder this underground aquifer discovery is so awesome. The Cascade Mountain Range, which contains the largest aquifer on Earth, stretches about 700 miles from Northern California to British Columbia. The high Cascades in Oregon have younger volcanic rocks, around 8 million years old. The Western Cascades are much older, 45 million years. They boast deep canyons and valleys. 
Scientists study the transition zone between these two areas to understand how water moved through volcanic rock and how volcanic processes had evolved over time. In the process, researchers measured rock temperatures at different depths. That's when the underground aquifer discovery happened. Normally, deeper rocks should be hotter because it's closer to the Earth's interior. But to everyone's surprise, in several areas, the temperature stayed the same even at greater depths. Well, this was a strong clue that water was flowing through the rock and cooling it down. In other words, the cascades function like a natural water tower, storing and slowly releasing water into rivers and streams. These geological water findings are important for two main reasons. First, it's our potential water source for the future. Such a massive amount of water stored underground could be an important resource. So far, we don't know how long it will remain in its current state and how resilient it's going to be to changes. So, we need more research to properly manage its use. Secondly, it affects volcanic activity. When water seeps deep underground and reaches magma, it instantly turns into steam, creating extreme pressure that can trigger explosive volcanic eruptions. Understanding how much water is stored in volcanic rock could help predict future eruptions and the risks they pose. Now, even though this discovery is exciting, there are still many unanswered questions. Like, how does this water move through the volcanic rock? or how much of it is actually usable as a water resource. Since this underground reservoir depends on rain and snow, a series of dry years could cause big problems for both water supply and volcanic stability. Researchers are now working to understand the full impact of the Cascades Volcanic Water Reservoir and how to manage it responsibly. But let's look closely at the geological wonder that is the Cascade Range. Picture this a massive mountain range stretching all the way from Northern California up to British Columbia, cutting right through the middle of Oregon. That's the mountain range we're talking about. In Oregon alone, it's about 260 miles long and up to 90 miles wide, covering 17,000 square miles. Whoa, that's bigger than each of the nine smallest US states. The coolest thing is that the Oregon part of this mountain range is basically built by volcanoes and apparently contains at least one volcanic rock water storage. The range itself exists because of something called the Cascadia Subduction Zone, where the Juan de Fuca tectonic plate, a chunk of Earth's crust under the Pacific Ocean, is slowly getting shoved beneath North America. As it sinks, the intense heat and pressure force water out of the oceanic rock. It lowers the melting point of the surrounding mantle and creates magma. That magma rises up and fuels the Cascade volcanoes. This is part of the Ring of Fire, the giant belt of volcanoes circling the Pacific. So, in a way, the Cascades are part of a much bigger volcanic system that's constantly shifting and changing. The Oregon Cascades are actually made up of two completely different zones, the Western Cascades and the High Cascades, and they look nothing alike. The Western Cascades are the older part. They formed around 45 million years ago. These mountains are rugged and deeply carved up by rivers. Some canyons are as deep as 3,700 feet. This part of the range used to be volcanically active, but over time, erosion has taken over, reshaping the land. The High Cascades, on the other hand, are much younger and way less eroded. Around 8 million years ago, the volcanic activity shifted, and new eruptions filled in old canyons, smoothing out the landscape. Eruptions kept piling up fresh lava, and rivers in this region didn't have as much time to create deep valleys like they did in the Western Cascades. That's why if you look at the two regions side by side, one looks jagged and carved up, while the other looks smoother and more built up. Some of Oregon's most famous volcanoes are located in the High Cascades. I'm talking about Mount Hood, Mount Jefferson, the Three Sisters, and Crater Lake, which actually formed when Mount Mazama erupted and collapsed in on itself. Unlike smaller volcanoes that pop up, erupt for a bit, and disappear over a few months or years, 
These giant volcanic centers have been active for thousands of years. And because they've been around for so long, they have way more complex magma systems. They produce everything from basalt, which is a runny, fast-moving lava, to andesite, dacite, and rhyolite. And rhyolite is the type of magma that leads to huge explosive eruptions. So, while some of these volcanoes might just ooze lava, others have the potential for devastating blasts. Another amazing thing about these long-lived volcanoes is that their underground magma chambers stay hot for a really long time. That's why the Cascades are one of the best places to tap into geothermal energy. There's a ton of heat just sitting beneath the surface, waiting to be used. Oh, and don't forget about the Cascades Volcanic Water Reservoir. Who knows how we will use it in the future? Now, we already know that the Cascades are part of the magnificent Ring of Fire, Earth's most explosive zone. Imagine a massive horseshoe-shaped belt wrapping around the Pacific Ocean, stretching for about 25,000 miles. It's one of the most geologically active areas on the planet. This is where Earth's tectonic plates are constantly shifting, colliding, and grinding against each other, creating some of the world's most powerful earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and deep ocean trenches. The Ring of Fire follows the meeting points of multiple tectonic plates, and they all surround the giant Pacific Plate. These plates aren't just sitting still, they're always on the move pushing against or sliding beneath each other at their boundaries, known as fault lines. When this happens, you get everything from deep sea trenches to towering volcanoes and violent earthquakes. One of the most extreme examples of this activity is the Mariana Trench, located east of Guam. At seven miles deep, it's the deepest ocean trench on Earth. It was formed by a process called subduction, where one tectonic plate is forced beneath another, sinking deep into the Earth's mantle. The Mariana Trench is one of the most mysterious places on Earth. It's insanely deep, with crushing pressure and total darkness. So for a long time, people thought nothing could live down there. But it turned out that life existed even at the very bottom. In 2005, scientists found a tiny single-celled organism in the Challenger Deep, the ahem, deepest part of the Mariana Trench. They also came across colorful rocky formations and weird sea cucumbers. The Mariana Trench also has hydrothermal vents, which are basically underwater hot springs. Even though the water there is super hot and acidic, strange creatures and microscopic life forms still manage to survive there. The Ring of Fire is also responsible for 90% of the world's earthquakes, some of the most powerful quakes in history have happened here, including the 1960 Valdivia earthquake in Chile, the strongest ever recorded, which hit a mind-boggling 9.5 on the Richter scale. But it's not just about earthquakes. The Ring of Fire is also home to about 75% of the planet's volcanoes. Some of the most famous eruptions in history have come from this region, like the infamous Mount Tambora in Indonesia. In short, the Ring of Fire is one of the most dangerous places on Earth, but it's also incredibly fascinating. Who knows what else scientists might discover in that region, like they discovered the largest water reservoir in the Cascades. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.